you are somebody, you know, you deal with facts, you deal with uh, analysis, rationality. How are you handling this world now where it seems like it's facts over feelings, anger over analysis? Feelings over facts. Oh, yeah, yeah, feelings over yeah. facts, you know, uh, anger over analysis. As a scientist, I mean, how do you make sense of what's going on right now? Yeah, it's side? frustrating. Uh, all I can say is the universe is in good shape. It's Earth that has all the problems, right? <laughs> so it's a frustrating time because you try to have a rational, in, informed conversation with someone about what is objectively true, mm -hmm. and then people argue vociferously against it. Right. And it's, it's revealing itself on many levels. I mean, there's the comical level where you have this movement of people who are sure the Earth is flat. Right. And so we laugh at that, and you might even sort of discount it, but that is a symptom, I think, of some other deeper... Um, state of mind where maybe it's not a state of mind, perhaps it's just a state of not knowing what science is and how and why it works. Yeah. We spend time in school learning, you know, you take a science class, we all did. I think the way it's taught is here's a satchel of knowledge, mm -hmm. which is facts. Learn them and then move on and, 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 and bubble on the test bubble and on the done. test and, and move done. on now you take the next class without realizing that science is a way of querying nature science is a way of asking questions about what you do not know mm -hmm. and if you don't think of it that way right. you'll just leave the science class behind you'll sell your textbook right. and you move on and then you you, you might feel the freedom to discount it as you would discount anything else you might have learned, not realizing that you don't actually have that option. Right. And, and, and it's dangerous because um, science and politics uh, uh, bump into each other. The climate debate seems to me there was a very recently Republicans and Democrats agreed on the science and were thinking about what to do about the policy. Now we can't even agree on the science. Uh, is, is, are we running out of time on climate? Yes. The broader problem is, if you have politicians arguing about what is established objective truths, then you're wasting time. Right. You're wasting everybody's time. That's not what politics should be. I have nothing against politics. I understand we live in a complex world. People have different ideas and feelings about what kind of world they want to live in. I get that. I'm mature enough to understand that. The problem comes about is when you go behind closed doors and you're arguing about what the scientists tell you, not arguing about what to do about, about what the scientist tells you. But the, the more those are delayed because you're wondering about whether the science is true, even though you have reports from scientific agencies establishing this, yeah. uh, I, 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 I worry in, for the future of the country. But what is the thing that worries you the most about climate? We've had relatively stable climate. No ice ages, no hot spells, and we've had these ice caps that have remained primarily in, in Antarctica and Greenland. Oh my gosh, if you melt those ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, the water levels will rise and come to the level of the Statue of Liberty's elbow. Okay? So, we are talking not so much, oh, it's so hot, it's gonna kill me. No, we're talking about sea level change and where are all the greatest cities in the world? They're on the ocean's edge, on the river's edge. My point is, what's gonna happen first? The coastal cities will get flooded. You're not gonna just see water levels slowly rise. That will happen, but that's not what you're gonna notice first. The storm, the swell, that previously only brought the water to here, now breaches your city walls. You'll see it in the extremes of the weather. And, and this will destabilize the world. And you know who knows about this is the military. Yeah, the, pe the Pentagon has pe no debate. Pe Pentagon has no debate. You know who else doesn't have a debate? Insurance companies. Right, right. But you're saying our, our, our cities are at risk, our civilizations are at risk, you're going to displace a whole bunch of people and that could cause all kinds of wars. It'll happen faster than you can move the city inland. Exactly. Yes. And so, and that, so that, that level of instability is something that, that worries me. Something else that you talk about is this whole idea of the, the relationship between the military and science. And, uh, you know, when Trump came out with his whole idea of the Space Force, uh, because I'm a progressive, I was like, well, that's just nuts, it's a, cr a crazy idea. But then I looked into it. I want you to see what I found out about the Space Force, and I want to get your reaction to it. Sure. Space Force. <laughs> President Trump says his proposed Space Force would prepare us for any potential Star Wars. Great shot, kid. That was one in a million. The Space Force would be a new equal branch of the military. Now, the last time the U.S. created a new military branch was 1947. That was the Air Force. 
It would manage space missile systems, build and launch satellites, and oversee all the military space-related programs that are currently being run by other departments like NASA or the Air Force. The new force would even have its own intelligence arm designing and operating spy satellites. The U.S. military has been a space player for quite some time, with the space shuttle actually delivering classified payloads like spy satellites into orbit. And this, the X-37B, it's a 29-foot unmanned space plane. It launches and lands like the old space shuttle. It stayed in orbit now for over two years at a time, but its mission is classified. President Trump says the force is necessary because adversarial countries like Russia and China are already building weapons and anti-satellite systems that could threaten the United States. When it comes to defending America, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. But not everybody is over the moon about this new agency. Some are worried that this new branch would be just too expensive. Some people are putting the cost at $12.9 billion over the first five years alone. It's a trap! Other critics are worried that you could spark a space race that could lead to real combat in the cosmos. So the Trump administration is hoping to get the new agency a liftoff by 2020, but in order for this to be anything other than pie in the sky, Congress must approve it. But is this a good idea or a bad idea, according to you? It may be some ideas are neither good or bad, they're just the right thing to do. Just because the idea came out of the Trump administration doesn't make it an, ir an irrational suggestion. Good, hey, listen, though, well, that, that's actually good to hear. Yeah, as you correctly noted, you would, you would shift away from the Air Force what is already controlling the U.S. Space Command, and it would just become its own branch. And if I would, if, if I would throw in maybe uh, uh, asteroid defense, why not? You wrote a book. Uh, about this relationship between astrophysics and war um, and, and the way that almost inevitably science and, and the military accelerate each other. Um, why, why did you write that book and what do you hope that people get from this book? The relationship between science and military might is well known, all right? It, it wasn't soldiers who invented the catapult. It was some engineer in the back room who said, hey, I can do this. And then military leaders said, let's take it. And use it. All right? And so... So for physics, you know, they made the bomb, and the chemists made the napalm, and the biologists might weaponize anthrax. What does the astrophysicist do? I care about things like dim things that I'll use multispectral imaging to detect. I care about sending moving spacecraft to intersect moving objects in space. I care about navigation. All where I am on the sky and where I am on Earth. And all of that could be used by the military. All of that. Yeah. Not only can be used, has been used. Are you trying to warn us that, that, about that, or are you just trying to make sure that we understand it? Help me understand your passion about that. Thank you. I grew up in New York City. It's a progressive city. It's a progressive place. My first awareness of culture and news was late 60s. And what is the state of the Vietnam War on our conscience? War e the equation was war equals bad. Right. And I had no way to understand why there were statues of heroic soldiers in reference to other wars. And I would have to mature into the state of mind, realizing that there are times when a bad agent rises up and you would be irresponsible as a contributing member of civilization if you did not stop it. And that's what happened in the Second World War with Adolf Hitler. Right. People rose up and you weren't saying, oh, war is bad, don't use my new invention to help defeat Hitler. You were saying, here, do it, use it as much as you can and I'll work on some more. Mm -hmm. So once I realized this and I said, I know my people, my, my historic brethren have been handmaidens to this, especially when it came to navigating the world. We don't make the bombs, but we tell you how to get to where you're going and how to find your enemy again, and how to know a coastline if you're gonna take over that land. But in this book, I don't, I'm not there to judge it, I'm there to expose it.